In this presentation, I'm trying to uh, provide you some information on how open science and open data can let can lead to open science. And so I'll provide you some concrete information. So I'll start with some introductory concepts, uh, definitions and considerations that actually drove all and steered how the work on NADRE so far. Then I will come on the specific topic of the presentation. And then I'll mention the, what we call the knowledge workflow and the opportunities for Ethiopia to embrace this new way of doing science and uh, actually uh, uh, try to implement, uh, uh, try, to, uh, try to develop uh, Ethiopia as a, a knowledge society. So, uh, some figures. Um, almost one year and a half ago, uh, we crossed the 50% limit in people connected to the internet. So there are more people connected to the internet in the world than people who are not connected. Of course, the number of people connected is very different uh, country by country, region by region, but this is actually a very good index. So the world population on the internet is more than half of the total population of the world. So more than uh, three billion and a half people connected to the to the internet and this is a tremendous success uh, 25 times increase in the last 20 years and also the quantity of the information available on the internet has increased still last year we crossed the threshold of one billion servers. There is one billion servers connected to the internet, providing information, providing data. So the data is growing, the data on the internet is growing exponentially. You can see uh, the increase as a function of time and this is due to the fact that so many people are connected more people are connected and the networks the capacity of the network and the capacity of storage and computing system is in steadily increased so just to, to give you some numbers uh, the traffic today is in the order of 15,000 petabytes a month what a petabyte is a petabyte is one followed by 15 zeros bytes. So if you are familiar with the uh, hard disks of your laptops, which is in the order of the tens of gigabytes, we are talking about one million more, a factor of one million more. Uh, internet data growing. This is a wider perspective. This is the data grow in general digital data growth in the world and so you can see the increase uh, and we are here in the order of tens of hundreds of zettabytes what a zettabyte is 10 to the 21 bytes this means 1 million petabytes 1 billion gigabytes so you can see i mean not, not, I mean, 10 uh, and uh, 1 billion uh, one uh, billion uh, petabytes and then uh, actually one trillion gigabytes so and the storage requirements grows every year by 20 to 40 percent and the information doubles every one to two years and if you look at the tremendous increase in digital uh, infrastructure in the world People say that uh, we have produced more information in the last 30, 50 years than what has been produced before by the humankind. A huge quantity of digital information, and this is going to increase very much. Uh, he here you have everything. You have uh, digital pictures, you have digital journals, you have everything. Of course, the same 
that this will explode, will increase with the onset of what is called the Internet of Things. Uh, with, the, with the onset of 4G and 5G networks, more, more and more devices are connected. So not only computers, but sensors everywhere, even in our homes. And uh, people foresee between 30 and 50 billion devices connected to the internet in the next few years. So more than seven, eight sensors per single person. So you can have uh, in the smart homes, smart cities, with uh, lots of sensors deployed everywhere and connected to the network. So now let's come to the scientific domain. So before I talked in general about data in the world, here I want to uh, provide you some examples on data in science. And, I'm, and I pick it three different domains. The first one is my own, high energy physics, particle physics. The, the most important data producer in the world is the Large Hadron Collider based at CERN. It's an underground accelerator crossing the Swiss, the Swiss and the French border. And in this accelerator there are four huge particle physics experiments. Each of them is made of uh, hundreds of millions of uh, tiny sensors. And they, ac they, they get uh, huge data uh, coming from the collision of particles on the accelerator. The data are distributed on a tiered hierarchy across the world. Tier zero, it's CERN. There is one tier one per country and there are about uh, 12 or 15 tier ones in the world. And then each country has a number of tier twos. So big data centers with the data are analyzed, are refined to produce the conclusions and then to produce the results that, um, that uh, then are put on the, on the papers. And uh, uh, those four, uh, in total, uh, more than 15,000 uh, physicists work at CERN on these four experiments, and they are distributed all around the world, and they work around the clock. So they're distributed really on the 24 time zones. And you can see that data are flowing from one side of the world to the other using the national, the regional, and the global research and education network. Uh, how much data? How many data? 0 0.5 exabyte, 500 petabytes so far. And this is increasing. Now um, LHC, the, the large other collider, uh, next year will, will start its second phase where many more data will be acquired. But it's not only the, uh, the wall quantity which is tracking, but uh, also the rates. Uh, data are taken at the same rate of 14 million pictures a second. So, 14 million pictures a second. That's another discipline. This is bioinformatics. And this is the global growth of DNA sequencing. There are machines now connected to computers that do sequencing of uh, DNAs. And you can see the tremendous increase there are several forecasts, uh, the most pessimistic in the order of a uh, few exabytes, the more optimistic in the, in the order of a uh, few zettabytes, but uh, uh, there is a huge increase in the next uh, five, ten years in the, num in the number of data coming from DNA sequencing. Another discipline is medical imaging healthcare. This is, uh, uh, these are data coming from a survey carried out in the US. Here, this uh, medical imaging in, in, in NMR, um, uh, spec, spec, medical imaging in general, uh, done with uh, uh, specific, specific machines, is the most important part of data production inside the hospital. Uh, you see, in the order of three petabytes, of uh, medical images per single machine, per single device. And people have estimated uh, 
uh, uh, data uh, or for medical images in the order of 35 zettabytes with a 44 times increase in the last 10 years. So a huge, num a huge production of data. Last but not least, cultural heritage. Uh, now 3D scanners, is, uh, often coupled with drones, are used to create very detailed 3D models of uh, cultural heritage. This is a very nice example, the Zamani project. The Zamani project is an African initiative to create 3D uh, 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 models of uh, a lot of cultural heritage in Africa. And if I'm not mistaken, there are also uh, monuments here in Ethiopia which are being uh, 3D scanned by Zamani. So these models contain a huge quantity of data because you have clouds of points. A 3D scanner takes a clouds of points and then you have to reconstruct the volume. And you can do this, you can see also the internals of the different monuments. The situation is uh, increasing because now 3D scanners are portable devices and you can even turn your smartphone in a 3D scanner. So cultural heritage is becoming one of the killer applications in so-called big data disciplines. So when we talk about science, we usually refer to what is called the scientific method. The scientific method was first proposed by Galileo Galilei at the beginning of the 17th century. Is it an iterative, iterative procedure to get to the knowledge, to discover the knowledge and to interpret natural facts? Uh, in the, you start from hypothesis, you run experiments, you produce data, you analyze data, you write papers and then you cite other uh, 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 other people work. So in the scientific method, in many aspects, data are crucial. So data is a very important part of the scientific method. If you do research, I mean, data is the most important component of the different aspects. Nevertheless, despite that data are very important, Science is transferred from one generation to the other through publications. Since the first uh, scientific journals coming in the middle of the 17th century, science is spread through publications. So you have journals and uh, basically we worry about science, because, uh, I mean, we, we, we transfer science, we disseminate science through publications. But science, or the scientific method actually, is based on two fundamental pillars. The scientific method requires that uh, experiments should be repeatable and experiments should be reproducible. So you may wonder if uh, science is reproducible. So, science is shared with papers. So people try to take seminal papers in different disciplines, especially medicine, oncology, and they tried to reproduce the conclusions of the paper. And they miserably failed. They took 52 very important papers in oncology. In, these papers have led to patents, have led to drugs. And only five out of the 52 papers could be reproduced. This means this, the, the results of these papers could be reproduced with independent analysis starting from the paper. So there is what is called a reproducibility crisis. And Nature, which is a very well-known journal, they, they surveyed almost 1,600 researchers from all over the world, and they asked them if there was a, a reproducibility problem in their own domain. So if they had problem in reproduce somebody else's work. And more than 
said yes, there is a significant crisis. And 38% this yes, there is a crisis, a slight crisis. So 90% of the respondents say there is a problem in reproducing data, in reproducing conclusions starting from papers, from publications. And this is basically the same with the small variants in uh, different domains. So the survey asked people why there is a, a reproducibility, what, what are the causes of this reproducibility problem. And the main causes are insufficient oversight, methods and codes available. The code used to, pro to analyze the data is not usually shared. You publish only the paper, you don't share the code. And raw data not available from the original lab. Again, you publish, but you don't share the data. So without the data, without the code, it's not possible to reproduce science. And the reproducibility of science is one of the main aspects of the scientific methods. I will come back on this in a moment. So, reproducibility, repeatability are very important aspects of the scientific method, but they are not whole. So, repeatability, reproducibility, replicability, but uh, what really matters is reusability. If you can have all the different components of a given research, then you can not only reproduce it, but you can reuse it. So you can take somebody else's data, somebody else's code, to go forward in the knowledge, try to extend the knowledge, try to tackle uh, more complicated problems, what are called societal challenges. And uh, tackling societal challenges is a really multidisciplinary problem. And so you have uh, to combine data coming from different disciplines. But you don't have the data. You only have the papers. We are struggling for open access, saying that publishing the paper is just nothing if you really want to profit of science done across the world. So, open science is, has been uh, uh, suggested in the last few years as a way of opening all the aspect of research to share data and to profit of this data sharing. There is, uh, um, in the Alleluia's presentation, we saw some definition. Actually, there is a, not a worldwide agreed definition of open science, but open science is a recipe rather than a definition, is, a, is an attitude in doing research, is a paradigm shift in sharing uh, research uh, components. And you see open science and research involves practices pro such as promoting open access to research publication, but this is not all. Open access is just the first step because publications doesn't imply that you can reuse science. Uh, so, open availability of research data, harnessing open source software and open standards, and open documentation of the research process. So you really have to share all the aspects, all the ingredients of scientific research. Of course, uh, open science is a complex of technologies. And uh, when you want to people uptake a technology, you should try to uh, uh, convince them that uh, the new technology is useful because the usefulness triggers the behavioral intention to use it. This is a very well-known um, technology uptake model. So, if we want to have researchers uptaking open science, doing open science, we should convince them that this is useful. And the technologies are also easy to use. That's another aspect. The perceived ease of useness of these things. Uh, if you are not convinced of this, look at your smartphones. 
Why are you using and buying smartphones? Because they are useful and they are easy to use. And now we have a huge number of smartphones worldwide. So, open science means opening up the whole research process. So not only publications, but you should open all the things. Uh, let me make a, a, a clear statement. Open doesn't mean free. We will come back on this point, crucial point, many times in the next today and tomorrow, but open doesn't mean free. That's very important. So, uh, open science have, uh, has enablers and beneficiaries. Of course, all the different stakeholders, Ministry of Science and Technology, Ministry of Education, universities, research networks, strategy centers, uh, uh, the government in general, should be enablers of open science. But when you enable open science and you define policies, this will change the culture of working together. Working together in the country, but working together or with other researchers, other scientists based in other countries in the world. And all the different stakeholders benefit from an open science. This is a study done in several uh, countries in Europe. So researchers, research teams, organizations, decision makers, the general public, and of course the country as a whole, the society as a whole. There are several schools of thought of open science. Uh, people mean that uh, 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 enabling open science uh, needs different uh, aspects and uh, components. In this presentation I will mention two things. The so-called democratic schools, where, where open access and open data are the most important enablers, and the infrastructure school, where data repositories and cloud computing infrastructures are the most important enablers of uh, open science. So I will come back to this point, to this, to, to this, I will, I will uh, mention these two things. So, open science is a combination of different aspects. And I will mention today a few of them. Open access, reference management, unique researcher ID, and uh, uh, digital object identifiers for documents and data. So, let's start with open, open access. So, in open access, uh, we have seen in the previous presentation the different kind of open access. The green open access is very important because uh, you usually publish the paper, but you don't publish the data and the software and all the information that has been used to, 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 uh, 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 to produce the results written in the paper. But you can do this in your institutional repository. So green open access is very important. And green open access, open access is rewarding also in the number, in the visibility of a given publication. Uh, visibility in terms of the number of citations, for example. These are um, energy physics papers. These are papers which are published on open access even before they are published on a journal. In the energy physics, uh, uh, large collaborations are used to share, to share publications even before they are submitted to a journal. And you see that uh, the papers published, uh, was, whose preprints are published in open access have a number of citations which is higher than the papers that uh, only published on normal, uh, normal journals. Also because there is a delay if you publish open access on your repository, you publish immediately. If you publish on a paper, usually the number of citations accumulates in six months to a year. But when we talk about uh, open access, uh, we said in the last majority of the case, open access refers to opening access to data, to publications. But publications um, we uh, needs also data and software and all the different aspects. So in science, there is what we call the data pyramid. 
very few publications are available with data, with metadata, and with the descriptions of how to use and reproduce the data. Very few. The last majority of data sets are hidden. So there is a huge potentiality of doing research which is inhibited just because authors do not publish data and software together with the publications. So, uh, the, 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 um, the uh, uh, researchers from all over the world came up and defined what we call FAIR principle. FAIR is an acronym and this stands for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. So data should be fair, should be findable, should be accessible, should be interoperable and should be reusable. So sharing data is useless if data are not fair. So for each of them you get the different requirements. And uh, fair data uh, have uh, different nuances. So you can, uh, you can go from totally unfair data, everything is closed, it's not available, to totally fair data. So for example, you can have only a persistent identifiers, you can have metadata, you can have also the data, and uh, the most fair data are data which are functionally linked. You can browse data, you can move from one data belonging to one discipline to other data belonging to another discipline and those data are semantically connected. To do so, data must have persistent identifiers. So let me clarify what persistent identifier is. Persistent identifiers belongs to what is called reference management. Librarians know very well what reference management is. And also, uh, also in the digital era, in the, in, the, in the era of digital publications, we are used with the PIDs, or in, uh, they also call them digital object identifiers. So if you look for a paper, if you, look at, if you find a paper on the web, every paper has a small code in this format, maybe. This is a PID. This is a persistent identifier. This uniquely identifier the paper and provides you the information where the paper is in the world. For example, the issue of a journal or the location of an institutional repository. But data, I, I said, should be connected. So the World Wide Web Consortium led by Tim Berners-Lee, the creator of the web, uh, came up with a classification of open data. So you may, you may say that uh, you take your data on any format and you put on the web and you are doing open data. Well, this is not open data. In the classification, this is just a one star open data. They used the star-based classification like hotels in the world. So, in, you should go from one star to five stars, where the data are available on non-proprietary format, they are semantically enriched, and they are linked. So you can link data coming from one discipline to data coming from another discipline, and try to combine them. Okay, so for example, if you want to maximize the growth in the agriculture, you may combine soil data with seeds data, with environmental data, with pathology data, and create applications that can inform farmers when they have to sow the seeds and when they will have to collect. So this is not available. And in many cases, you get the rain or you get uh, unfair climate and then your growth for that year is completely wasted. So this kind of big problems, especially in regions where there are difficulties in uh, uh, having sensor data, this is very important. 
and I'll show you some real applications on this multidisciplinary uh, problems. So when we talk about uh, linked open data, we usually refer to semantic web. So what is the semantic web? The semantic web is a complex interaction of standards, standard-based technologies, computer technologies, information technologies. But I don't, want to, I, want, I don't want to go into the details here. I want to show you in, a very, in three pictures how semantic web works and why semantic web is so important to link data. So semantic web uh, relies on the connection between a subject and an object through a predicate. Very, quick, very easy. Subject, predicate, object. Let me, make, let me make an example. Margaret Atwood is, so this means has type, person. Margaret Atwood is a person. This is a statement. And this is a uh, semantic information on Margaret Atwood. But you can also say Margaret Atwood was born in Ottawa. That's another information you have on Margaret Atwood. But then you can combine information, you can link information. So Margaret Atwood was born in this date, was born in Ottawa, is a person. These are all the information you can attach to Margaret Atwood. On the other end, you can say that Ottawa is the capital of Canada, Ottawa has this population, and Ottawa is the first place or Bruce Cockburn. Then you can link concepts using semantic web technologies. So this is not anymore an isolated concept. This is not an, anymore an isolated concept. No, now these two are linked, and you can navigate from Margaret Hartwood which you, 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 you can say, Margaret Hadwood is one of uh, that many people living in Ottawa. Before, you didn't know. Now, with the link, you increase the knowledge. So you can increase the number of semantic connections. And you can have things like this. This cloud is the linked open data cloud of DBpedia. DBpedia is the linked open data database underneath Wikipedia. So when you look on a Wikipedia page and you have all these links automatically done, they are taken from DBpedia. So you can move, if, if you look at the one page of Wikipedia, you have concepts coming from other disciplines. This is because the page is automatically generated from DBpedia. So, Having linked data, you can enrich the metadata of the data, you can make knowledgeable, knowledge searchable, and you can make new knowledge discoverable and findable. So the combination of PIDs, personal identif persistent identifiers, and the, and the use of semantic web can provide you better searchability and discoverability and findability of data. So data gets economic value because they can be reused also for economic purposes. Uh, so how, how does that open data worth? A lot. The European Open Data Portal, which is one of the largest uh, linked open data services in Europe, carried out a study on the economic value of open data. And they came up with that huge number, 325 billion euros in the direct and indirect value, indirect market of open data in Europe in the next few years. More than 100,000 jobs working on open data and uh, almost 2 billion euros saved using open data, in, especially in public administration and government. So there is a huge opportunity in, open, in, uh, use, in reusing open data coming from different scientists. So not only for scientists, but also for private companies. And this opens new opportunities, uh, especially for um, 
uh, countries that have a gap with respect to the other parts of the world to speed up the um, increase of their economies. So when there is an economic value, there is also a value chain. So, and the value chain involves the public sector, universities, research organizations, and the private sectors, companies, startups, new economy companies. So for the public sector are very important for data creation, data validation, data aggregation and analysis. And then the private sector can come in with aggregations and uh, production of services that uh, really uh, provides stakeholders with application to analyze open data, for example, to make better decision, better decisions. So open data is very important. Unfortunately, as I said before, the uptake of open data is uh, quite uneven around the world. I'll, I'll provide you two examples. So one is the Open Data Barometer, which is um, an organization, an agency, issuing every two years this map. So red means very few open data, mostly closed data. Green means uh, mostly uh, open data. And you can see how green, red, or yellow is the world. Uh, why countries are countries where they do not know about the existing of open data. That's another, um, that's another agency. This is the Global Open Data Index, the same thing. And you can see the distribution. You can go to this page and, uh, and, and try to, to go deep into the... Oh, you, can, you are welcome to take notes, but all these slides are already on the agenda. So if you are connected to the agenda, you can download all these presentations. But I mean, feel free to take notes, of course. So, um, there is a problem of sharing and uh, 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 fostering the uptake of open data. So, in the SciGaia project, an European project that uh, I will talk about uh, in uh, uh, mostly later and uh, tomorrow, uh, we have tried to uh, take very seriously open science, so seriously that we have tried to build an open science platform. So, a series of interacting services that can help people to do open science. So uh, let me remind what open science is. Normal science, you start from concept, you gather data, you analyze data, and you write publication, and that's it. In the open science, you want to go the other way around. You want to start from a publication, get the data used in this publication, gets the software that has been used to analyze the data and be able to reproduce and to reuse the data. So there are a series of enablers. We have already discussed this open access, open data, digital object identifiers, cloud infrastructures, open source, open educational resources are all enablers of open science. So with these enablers, you can build commons. Commons means you can create a platform made of open bricks that you can rearrange the way you want. In this project, we came up with a, a linked open data infrastructure, data repository, science gateways, so a portal to execute applications on distributed infrastructure, a collaboration forum, and a platform for massive online open courses, the so-called MOOCs. So we, will, we used all this, and uh, all these services were uh, supported federated access. What does it mean? That uh, you need to have just a one pair username and password to access to single sign-on across all the services. So tomorrow, in the, in the tutorial, you will get first your federated credentials, and then you will use several of the services of the NADRA infrastructure. And you will see how single sign-on actually works. So, in the, in the context of NADRA, the most important component of this platform is the open access repository. And uh, last year, in February 2017, we came to um, run Hackfest, an intensive training event in Addis, 
in the context of this project, and uh, we created uh, the very first, the very first uh, uh, prototype, the very first pilot of, of the uh, open access repository. Open access repository not only for publications, but for everything, for every kind of uh, uh, multimedia contents, data, images, videos, whatever. And uh, uh, what, what is very important, uh, in this, we also uh, managed to, to have uh, the Ministry of, the Educa of, edu of Education hold a digital object identifier prefix. The Minister of Education asked the, the conference of the rectors of the Italian University, which is the a member of DataSite. DataSite is an international organization that issues DOI prefix. So the, the Minister of Education asked to get a prefix for Ethiopia and the prefix was done. The prefix is 10.20372. Out of this prefix an unlimited number of sub-prefix can be created and for each sub-prefix an unlimited number of DOIs. This means that all institutional repositories of all Ethiopian universities may tag their own records with DOIs. So they can profit of what I said. DOIs can be findable, discoverable, and if you tag data with DOIs, you can increase the reusability of data. And we will see this tomorrow, how this works. The Nadra Central Repository already has a DOI as a prefix. Of course, universities like Jima universities who want you to keep their round repository, they will be able to create, assign a DOI prefix and assign DOIs to all the resources in the repository. So, what do we want to achieve in the end? What we want to achieve the possibility to, to create what we call the knowledge workflow, which is an enabler of uh, knowledge society. So, researchers can go and search for linked data or publication using keywords. They find what they are interested in and maybe they can reproduce or reuse the data and the so because they also have all the components, they have the software, they have uh, the cloud infrastructure available, so they can reuse the data to produce a new knowledge. The new knowledge goes into a new paper. The paper is stored on an open access repository using a DOI. Also the other papers, the data have had a DOI, so you can extend the series of DOIs that refer to a given scientific problem. So you can increase the knowledge on this specific topic. And you can go on and on. What is the advantage? The advantage is that you can create the knowledge in XE. So this is uh, um, a way of displaying relations among data on a linked open data infrastructure. It, every link, you remember Margaret Atwood and the links with Ottawa. This is the same. These are links connecting publications, researchers, publishers, and data. And you can navigate this. You can do simply, uh, simple things. You can do complicated things, but this is a program, and this is a human being that can do this. Of course, the big advantage of linked open data is that using DOIs, data are discoverable by machines, by computer programs. So you can analyze petabytes of data and discover new knowledge. Human beings cannot do that. You don't have the time and the speed. Computers. With the, with the specific programs can do that. So you can run, you, 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 you can run codes on linked open data uh, databases and you can extract new knowledge. And then you can use the knowledge to either take decisions or tackle big problems, multidisciplinary problems.
So that's the way where we want to go. Nadra wants to uh, uh, um, the, the, provide all Ethiopian researchers with the opportunity to share the data. And Nadra will be one single node of a worldwide linked open data infrastructure. So that's it. Thank you very much.